Greetings to everyone. Bienvenue, uh, bienvenidos. Um, I'm Shauna Van Praag, a professor of law here at McGill, um, and I'm coordinator of this year's Annie McDonald Langstaff workshop series. It's a real honor to welcome all of you um, to via Zoom to Montreal, to McGill, to the Faculty of Law, to the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, and to this first workshop in the series this year. Um, I think you will have seen that the session is being recorded with the consent of our speakers. Um, so please keep your microphones muted, but uh, feel free, as I see some of you have, which is lovely, uh, to turn on your videos. The Annie McDonald Langstaff workshop series started in 1988 at our Faculty of Law. Annie McDonald Langstaff was the first woman to earn a law degree in Quebec. She did so as a single mother, and she graduated from McGill in 1914 with first class honors. But she was not permitted to write the exams for the Quebec bar, so she never practiced as a lawyer. Over the six decades that she worked as a legal assistant in Montreal, she continued to fight for women's equality, especially with respect to the right to vote. And eventually, in 1941, women did gain admission to the Quebec bar. Annie McDonald Langstaff was posthumously admitted to the bar in 2006 and awarded the Medal of Honor from the Bapeau du Québec, and that medal is housed here at our faculty. As was the case last year in 2020-2021, McGill's Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism is the generous co-sponsor of the faculty's Annie McDonald Langstaff workshops this year. I'm absolutely delighted about this collaboration and I'm grateful to the center's directors, Nandini Ramanujam and Frédéric Maigret. And in particular, I want to signal thanks to Sharon Webb, who I think runs the center, and to Elise Mallette, a fourth year law a student assistant, both of whom have provided remarkable support. And it's Sharon who is hosting this Zoom session. The invitations to all of our speakers, both last year and this, are grounded in connections between the guest speakers and members of the Human Rights and Legal Pluralism Center, both professors and doctoral students. So this brings me to the unique format of the workshops. Organized around the general theme of mothers-in-law intergenerational dialogues on women and human rights, Last year, the general theme was leading the change, the potential and power of women in law. The workshops take the form of dialogues with women doctoral students at McGill's Faculty of Law who come from around the world. The collaboration with the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, combined with the central participation of the doctoral candidates at our faculty, assures the strength and success of our Annie McDonald Langstaff workshops this year, and I think is a very nice testament to Annie McDonald Langstaff herself. So with all of this, you will have noticed that I have not yet mentioned the name of our first guest of the year. That, of course, is intentional. I have left that honor to Maya Ceballos Bedoya, a doctoral student in her fourth year at McGill, who has just returned to Montreal from Colombia. And she will introduce our first mother-in-law and will then engage her in dialogue until shortly after two o'clock, at which point there will be time for questions and conversation with the audience. So again, bienvenidos, bienvenue, welcome. And I will turn over to Maya to introduce our guest, Maya. So hello everyone. Again, um, um, my name, as Professor Fanfrak said, is Maria Ceballos. I'm a fourth year uh, DCL student. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jaramillo and our audience uh, uh, for joining us today, of course, and, and, and thank you, uh, Professor Fanfrak, for solving this issue and, and for that very energizing uh, introduction to this workshop series. Um, Okay, I, I must say that it is a true honor and, and pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Isabel Jaramillo Sierra. Uh, professor Jaramillo is currently a full professor at the Faculty of Law of um, La Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, in, in Colombia. Uh, she holds a law degree from the same university and also an SJD from Harvard Law School. Um, as Professor Van Prack uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this year's workshop series is entitled Mothers in Law, Intergenerational Dialogues on Women and Human Rights. 
And I, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Jaramillo is the perfect guest to open this series of conversations because she is one of the most prominent mothers in law in the Colombian legal uh, academic field. And I would argue that she is a mother in law <laughs> uh, from many perspectives, but I would like to highlight uh, two of them today. Um, first, uh, Professor Jaramillo is definitely a role model and an inspiration for many legal scholars in Latin America, uh, particularly for feminist scholars. Um, she, she not only holds um, a full-time position uh, at, the, at one of the best universities in Latin America, uh, but also has had a, a very prolific academic uh, career. She has written and co-edited several publications on sexual violence and criminal law, legal education, family law, transitional justice, comparative private law, among many <laughs> other topics. Uh, she has also been a consultant to the uh, Colombian government on issues of transitional justice and sexual and reproductive rights. And um, I would say that Professor Jaramillo has also been a mother-in-law from a second perspective in the sense that she has mentored many feminist scholars and activists who have not even been her students at all. And uh, she has created and participated in various in, in very powerful networks of feminist scholars. And in fact, she is one of the co-founders, and we will talk about this uh, later, of course. Uh, she's one of the co-founders of Red Alas, which is a, a network of feminist scholars in Latin America and of which I am proudly a member in the Colombian chapter. Um, okay, well, uh, before I start with my first uh, question, I would like to confess uh, that I feel a bit strange talking to Professor Jaramillo in English instead of Spanish as we usually do, uh, but well, I once uh, read that uh, Charlemagne, the Roman emperor, uh, used to say that speaking in a second language was like having a second soul. Uh, so I guess uh, Professor Jaramillo and I will be having this conversation between our second or secondary souls <laughs> just for the sake of sharing her work with the Canadian and the international uh, community. Uh, so welcome again, uh, Professor Jaramillo, bienvenida. Thank you, Maya. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, great to see such a diverse community and that so many people could make it to uh, to the workshop. So, so thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, this first session uh, has been dedicated to the idea of finding voice. Um, so my first question for you would be how how did you find your own voice as a legal scholar and particularly as, as a feminist scholar? And I would say as a scholar with an inclination towards activism and human rights. I, I, I don't know if perhaps there were specific moments that triggered your vocation or if you had your own mothers-in-law or, or fathers-in-law uh, who helped you or pushed you uh, to, to like in your path to, to becoming what you are. So yes, thank you, Maya. I was thinking about this question. So of course, Maya was generous enough to send me uh, her long list of questions. So uh, I've had time to think this over. And uh, so the first thing I, I think I would like to say is that um, I, I somehow ended up as a law professor working on feminist uh, scholarship, uh, rather by uh, a set of decisions that other people made for me. And, and that was sort of unfortunate and it, make, it made me suffer for the first years. Um, but then I think I've, I've embraced the fact that I've found within um, academia, uh, a network, a community that has supported me and allowed me to grow as a scholar. So 
I first started writing on legal pluralism and I was very much interested in the rights of indigenous peoples. And uh, while doing that work, I got two messages from different sets of peoples. One was, well, why don't you write about yourself and your own oppression instead of someone else? You know, you're certainly not part of any community. And that was harsh and I think not very nice, but um, you know, that it, it resounded. Well, I could write also about feminism, right? It shouldn't be uh, exclusive. Uh, but then I also ended up being a professor because my boss at the time, I used to work at the constitutional court, you know, told me, well, maybe you, you know, there's this position open for a very young scholar. And I think you are the person who should be there. They were hiring and they only had men candidates and they wanted a woman. So they ended up hiring two, one man and one woman. So they wanted parity within the law school. So that was a first step of becoming a law professor with a feminist agenda. And then um, I guess that the process of finding a voice was more complex and, and, and certainly much longer. Um, I, I, I have to say that I was very grateful uh, to many women uh, who invited me to work with them. And, you know, we have this project on gender. You have the legal expertise. Would you come and explain to us the legal part? And, and that was usually psychologists or economists or political scientists. And, and so I, I was in some way through this being a, an ex a specialist in everything, right? I had the gender answers for everyone. Uh, I think I started to build a community within which I had an identity, a community in which, you know, initially there were uh, mentors, you know, uh, established professors who uh, were working on in other disciplines and were appreciative of what lawyers had to say in a country that was undergoing such a huge transition um, constitutionally. And so uh, that was a, a first part. And, I, and then I would say uh, a second part was, uh, you know, finding or, you know, supporting the work of many, many young scholars who were interested in doing scholarship in Colombia, where we had a very fragile environment uh, at, at the beginning of the 2000s and people were really struggling to, uh, to go into academia. And, and so that was the second part of that voice, which is uh, the voice I have built with my students. Um, most of them uh, doctoral students. And uh, and then I would say, I would add to that voice, the work with activists. Uh, since my very first uh, big project, I have been very interested in understanding feminism as it exists in the street, right? Not feminism in legal academia in, Amer in, in Latin America uh, was very um, scarce, right? There were actually no mentors who were experts on gender and the law at the moment I started my career um, as a scholar in Colombia. Uh, I could talk more about where they went, right? This, and they had left. Uh, and, uh, but then that other part was finding feminist, legals, feminist legal knowledge with activists doing the work of changing the law, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say that I was uh, lucky enough to have great mentors in Cristina Mota and Elena Alviar. And then I had great students uh, such as uh, Lina Uccelli and Maria Victoria Castro. And, well, and there's a list, not very long. And then I've had, um, you know, I've had a lot of work with activists, uh, Monica Roa and Ana Cristina Gonzalez and others. My impression from the outside is usually, and, and I, I think many students tend to have that perception, that the process of becoming an activist or a feminist is very organic and it's very intuitive. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, this thing you're telling us about how, in a way, other people pushed you or, or, or made the decision for you. Uh, so it was, it was organic, but not, it wasn't necessarily your first choice or what you initially decided to do. Um, 
so no like like the second uh, part of your of, of your answer professor Jaramillo was also like i was saying that was very moving in the sense that you you talk about how you you didn't find your own voice on your own but with the help of your students and other activists even from other disciplines and that's connected to some of the other questions that i that i have planned uh for you um my second question would be like um you of course have an extensive experience as an academic but you also have been a consultant to the colombian government and you have worked with all these activists like you you just told us about um and in fact a very interesting aspect of your work is that you tend uh like an aspect that i love about your work is that you tend to underscore not only the potential, but also the limitations of feminist discourse, or or at least of certain feminist arguments. Um, for example, I recently read one of your lectures on the limitations of the arguments that promote uh, gender parity in, in powerful positions. Um, so, so I wanted to ask you why or, or to what extent is it important to include women's voices or a feminist perspective in the study of law um, and and why has it been important for you in the Colombian context? And I guess you, you have a lot to, to tell us based on your experience with these activists groups and, and doctoral students. Um, but on the other hand, I also wanted to ask you, when, when is it necessary to sort of take a break from seeking those voices or that feminist perspective, if that were the case? Okay, so that that's yeah, it's interesting. I I think on the one hand, I I I don't think we're you know even close to feeling that there's enough women in legal academia in Latin America, and uh, and uh, so in that sense, it's hard to imagine whether you know there would be a moment in which we have to switch the project and then we have to get more men in so i i am a believer in parity in parity in a, like very extensive um but i i i think that the one issue is how much how many and how many women we want to have in academia and then there's another one how much feminism do we want uh, in academia uh I think I, I think feminism is such an important part of um, our contemporary thinking about the world, but also about the law. Um, and I, I've one of the reasons why I work with activists so much is I think that there's a lot of knowledge that they're being able to accumulate. There's all this learning uh, about how the law the law works on the ground that we really need a strong academia that is able to process that knowledge and, you know, and rehash it and make it uh, understandable um, as theory and workable for people who uh, want to uh, reproduce these strategies in the future. So I think there's a lot of room to grow um, both for women in legal academia and then for feminism, right? Feminism in legal academia still has a lot to learn about how law works and how legal reform works. You know, fem Latin American feminists have been doing a lot of legal reform and we still don't understand fully the uh, what's driving the reform, what's going on, where are the successes and the failures. So, but I, I yeah, I, I do think on the one hand that we have to keep mindful of diversity within feminism and that, you know, there's different voices within feminism and that there is bound to be conflict and disagreement. And so that's one part of the limitations in if you're thinking of, you know, the limits of feminism as a project. Well, that's one that we should always be aware of. Um, uh, and therefore more feminism as a critical position and not as a dogma or a set of um, finished um, um, theories or uh, principles. I think the other uh, 
my other, the, the other limitation that I constantly find with some feminist positions is the difficulty in giving up some power when it comes to others who are, you know, finding it harder to. So, so I've been called quite often recently in the last year uh, to talk in the name of feminism with uh, disability um, activists because they find it very hard to speak to most feminists, right? They, they, they are clashing strongly and they find feminists dogmatic. And I know this is not the case in many places of the world and disability activists in many, in many contexts speak of how they have used feminism as a very strong tool to re reinterpret their own battles, et cetera. But it's been in the last year, a huge fight. And, you know, and when I am engaged in these conversations, I feel, well, how is it that, you know, mainstream feminists or some feminists are not able to understand, you know, that sometimes, you know, we do have to acknowledge that it, uh, feminism doesn't have all the answers and that we have to listen more than we preach in many, many circumstances. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the two ways in which I keep insisting in feminist, feminism's own limits, right? The, the diversity and, uh, you know, and how we, we have much more power than we're most of the times willing to concede. Um, uh, thank you for, for, for that answer. Um, actually that maybe I should have framed my question differently because I don't think that your work only shows the limitations of feminism, but it's more generally very committed to an intersectional perspective. And like you, I recently read another one of your opinion pieces, pieces on racial diversity and how we don't talk about it as as much as we should. Um, so I, I hope we will have uh, time to talk about your intersectional commitment uh, later. But first, I, I wanted to ask you another question about like your role as a mentor, uh, because it's 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 at, it's at the heart of of our discussion today. Um, and our topic of being a, a mother-in-law. Um, so as Professor uh, Van Prack mentioned, uh, this workshop aims to, to be a space for intergenerational dialogue, right? That's, that's supposed to be the idea. Uh, but to be honest, uh, you and I, Professor Jaramillo, we are not even a generation apart. <laughs> uh, but still, I remember that you have been mentoring feminist scholars in Colombia for, for many years since I was very, very young. And of course you were very young as well. Um, so this means that you have been a mother-in-law for, for many years. You have been creating networks, leading reading groups, uh, teaching of course, uh, to the point that you have become a mentor for, for many feminists uh, in the legal field. And in fact, I wanna tell the audience this, this this story, uh, I, it was very moving that when I posted this workshop on Twitter a couple of days ago, some of my colleagues uh, reacted saying exactly that, like, that you have been a mentor and a role model to many of us, and, and I would count myself uh, in that group. So I wanted to ask you, maybe your answer is, I think is intimately connected to what you replied uh, before, um, but, I wanted to ask you about the process or the reasons that led you from such a young age uh, to take on this role of mentoring other scholars and to work in order to create stronger networks. Um, and I don't know if I would like to hear if there were like a specific events or situations that sort of, again, triggered all this work you do uh, with, with the feminist scholars in Colombia and Latin America. Uh, so, so I think I could start by just, you know, giving a little bit of context. Uh, so the law school where I work uh, was founded in 1968, if I'm not wrong, somewhere there. Uh, so we're not so new, but we're new enough. Uh, but the law school, this when the 1991 constitution was approved and became a project for the country. 
a transitional project. Uh, the law school decided that they needed to create uh, a body of full-time professors who were dedicated to legal academia as their main uh, job. And uh, one of the masterminds behind that was Cristina Mota. Uh, she was convinced that the only way to achieve that would be if she recruited very, very young, um, fresh out of law school, which is an undergraduate degree in Colombia, uh, students, re recent graduates, and that they would, you know, start an, an academic career, they would send us out to get PhDs, and then we would come back and we would, you know, create. And, and, and so I was in the first batch of that project. Then they tried other things, but actually I think my route was the one that finally did work, right? Hiring very young, very young students, fresh out of law school, sending them, sending them out for doctoral degrees and coming back. And so we were very young. So, but we were very committed to changing legal education in the context of the new constitution and the promise of, you know, peace, democracy. Um, so, so, you know, we're very young, we're very committed, we were, we want, we would put all the work we needed to <laughs> into this project. Uh, and then when I came back from my doctoral studies in, in the US, the, 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 at the moment, the university had the project that we had to have doctoral programs. So that this was the only way in which the university would accumulate enough knowledge, produce knowledge, if we had doctoral students. So we were still very young. We were few. Uh, but they, you know, university authorities asked our own set of professors, Professor Elena Alviar, who you also know, to write the project and get it approved. So we were very hesitant and even reluctant because we thought we were very young. And I think there were only seven of us who had PhDs, uh, but Elena is a very, very smart person. And so she decided she would do it and uh, she made it work. And so what, I was one of those professors and uh, the students wanted to have, you know, someone had to be in charge. And so I was, I think, from the beginning, I thought, you know, these are more my colleagues than my students, but I'll be there for them to work together through this process, right? Um, and so it was more uh, of, uh, about building a community. And in that community, people had to play different roles, right? Uh, and some of us, well, some of us played the role of, you know, supervising dissertations, even if we had been just very, very, very recently out of our own dissertation writing. Now, I think one part of it, so I think that the creation of the doctoral program and the fact that we were committed to make this work um, uh, was crucial in that. Uh, then there was also almost at the same time, we created Red Alas, or the Alas Network, which was a network of law professors in Latin American law schools uh, who were interested in topics of gender and sexuality. So it was going to be like the feminist law professors uh, in Latin America. And there were 18 of us. And uh, that was certainly, although it doesn't have directly to do with mentoring, it has provided an environment and a community that has allowed us to grow and has, you know, that the impact that we might have had only locally has extended into other places. I, 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 I've, so I would say those two elements contributed. Uh, there was a sense, a feeling, uh, an intuition that in Latin America we needed, as we made law schools stronger for the transitions, for the democratic transitions in in our countries, we needed to have, you know, strong um, law professors. And among them, we had to have the feminists. So, so I think those two contributed into giving us the confidence to do this mentoring, which otherwise uh, would have not been possible. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you. I, I, I guess I have a follow up uh, question to what you just said, um, because your answer is tied to sort of the institutional dynamics of Los, of Los Andes University. But you have also mentored many other scholars outside of the institution. So for example, like I mentioned before, you have reading groups in which you allow <laughs> uh, students from other universities. And I feel that you are very active sort of outside the boundaries of your own work as a professor at, at, at Los Andes University. So how, how, how or why did you decide to undertake <laughs> that extra work or how, like, yes, if you could tell us about the process of being so inspired, inspired and so committed to, to, to your work as a feminist. And, and I do think that the work you do in Redalas, when you build networks, it's sort of mentoring in a way because you're helping women uh, and feminist scholars uh, to understand that we have to work together. <laughs> So I don't know. Well, I guess I see mentoring like different levels of mentoring. So one, one form of mentoring is this very close uh, work, being, being nearby, uh, giving support intellectually, et cetera, which is work I've done with my master's students and my doctoral students. Um, so the, that's, yeah, of course, it's much more intense and, and I'm, you know, and I think, why would I do it? I'm always, I have to say, this is almost embarrassing, but I'm always so surprised that people would be interested in the things I'm interested in and even grateful that they would be willing to do this work, right? I, I always, there's so many things working against us, right? There's so many risks. There's, uh, the, the shame, the uh, little, the few resources, uh, the embarrassment. I mean, and so, so that people would have the energy and the, um, and the willingness to do the work. I, I always find it surprising and I think it's a gift. So I, I, I try to, so this is like the second level of mentoring, uh, create these spaces, these rooms, these conversations where they might, find a place. So you, you mentioned, well, you have these reading groups and all these other activities. And I would say, well, yeah, if a student comes to me and says, you know, I seriously want to, you know, engage this conversation. I think you were with me. We were discussing Hannah Arendt's views on the public and the private. And, and I thought, well, if she has enough energy and I've read this, of course, I don't agree. Well, let's have this conversation and have it with whoever would join. And actually, I was surprised and grateful that so many people joined. It was a strange topic. Not many people are interested. If I had offered a course, no one would have come. Uh, and so, and so uh, we did the reading group, which was great. And it was a great experience. So I, and, and, and this is the same for Red Ala. So, in, so we create chats, we create a colloquium, we create a seminar, we create, and all that I see as these places where people can meet and share. And again, in my experience, everyone is just really grateful to find someone who is thinking about similar issues, who has the same, you know, problems with their careers, etc. And so just finding others with whom they can share their ideas and their reflections is just um, so I, I have to say that this is what inspires me to do all this work. Then again, I have to also mention, and many of my colleagues in other parts of the world remind me, you've been very lucky. Los Andes has allowed you to do all these things. You don't have to, you know, there's these requirements which are so difficult. You don't have to all the time, you know, be in the boundaries of the requirements. Um, and, and, and probably there's a lot, there's a lot to that, right? I, I have to, I have to acknowledge that I've been, uh, in many ways, I've been let alone 
uh, so I can be, I can do the things that I enjoy and I like. Um, uh, thank you. I, I, I find that that answer and that process very inspiring, and I feel I feel kind of bad because I I, I don't know I, if I, I I should take advantage more often of those spaces that you open in Real Alas and, and with other communities in Colombia. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it more often uh, in the future. Um, but I, I would like, we, we have been talking about uh, Alas Network, Red Alas, and, but, and, and you already told us like the, the broad purpose uh, that brought you together. But I don't know if there was like an event or a project uh, that brought you together or or how was it born like why these initial 18 members I think you mentioned uh, came up with the idea of founding Redalas and and how many members does the the the, the network uh, have uh, today that's a that's a very good question so Redalas um, so the precursor of Redalas was a book project a book project led by uh, a young graduate from Universidad de Los Andes who was working at the Center for Reproductive Rights in New York, and she was the director for Latin America or something. And, and so she, the Center for Reproductive Rights has, has had a, a tradition of working with academics, right? For them, it has been really important that academics work with activists. So this is a project for the Center for Reproductive Rights. And Luisa Cabal, uh, who was there as a director of the Latin American program, decided that for their project of understanding sexual reproductive rights in Latin America, instead of hiring a consultant, they would find uh, legal scholars that would write the chapters. And so uh, she talked to me and to Julieta Lemetre at Universidad de Los Andes because we were at her uh, uh, her home university, and she asked, you know, whether we could do this project, and and we started to look for legal academics in Latin America who would write chapters on sexual and reproductive rights in their own countries, and it was very hard. We actually didn't know who was doing this type of work in Latin America. Um, the previous generation, right, maybe 10 or 15 years older than us, who had done work on um, feminism or gender and the law, were actually working as consultants for international organizations. So they were at the United Nations, different bodies, so Alda Facio, for example, or Lorena Fries in Chile was doing in her own NGO, very deeply committed to human rights, etc. So in Chile and Costa Rica, where there had been feminists, or in Argentina, they were in the judiciary, um, as such as Alicia Ruiz. And, and so in my generation, people willing to do this work, which was you know, very intense, very little money. It was just because we wanted to do it. Uh, we, it was very hard to find them. And so we ended up writing the book. Well, I wasn't there and then someone else took over. Uh, and so the book was written, but that book was a, a, a starting point for the question, who is doing this work in Latin America? Why so few? Why can't we find them? Why did we end up looking up again consultants or uh, women in NGOs who might write chapters about some countries. And so from that idea, which I think was mostly Luisa Cavalls, but also Paula Vergallo from Argentina, from Argentina and uh, Julieta Lemetre in Colombia and Cristina Mota. And, and so they thought, well, let's just create a network that will allow us to identify who is doing this work in the region. And through creating this community, maybe we will produce some more synergy and have more energy and promote these uh, um, legal scholars in the region. And so that was the beginning. And there were 18 of us, which we identified in the way I'm telling you, we're 
professors who are doing some work on, on human rights, maybe something on women's rights. Uh, and we identified them through their work with NGOs. Um, and, and now we're 76 and we're constantly having the conversation, we should open up membership because there's many, many more now that would like to be part of the network. Uh, and so it's been, um, so many things have happened in the region, of course. We cannot think that the, the, the Red Alas is uh, you know, responsible for, <laughs> but I think that many of us have, with that support, have been able to mentor many, many scholars in our countries. So just as I've done in Colombia, Paula Vergallo has done in Argentina, right? So she has a huge uh, group of young scholars who have worked with her and, do, and are doing today uh, work on gender and the law because of her influence. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's a little bit of the story of Redalas, who, uh, which was 50, turned 15 years old yet yeah, now. It was created in 2004. Yes, 2004. I was pregnant, huge belly with my twin daughters that year. Okay, that's such a wonderful story. I've heard it before. Uh, I think you told us that, that story in a previous um, Bond Society meeting and I find it absolutely wonderful and powerful. I, I just pasted uh, the Redalas link uh, here in the chat so you can visit it. Um, it you, you truly uh, promote a, 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 a remarkable work. Um, as you said, there are many feminist scholars, but, but also uh, like feminist activists in the in in the in the network. Uh, for example, many of you have been very active and very effective, actually, in disseminating uh, the arguments in favor of of abortion in Latin America, and we're in the midst of that discussion as we speak in Colombia. So so we have uh, a lot to thank you. Um, I. Okay, my, my next question will be sort of an interruption to what we've been uh, talking about. Um, but as some of you know, I'm conducting a research project on gender inequalities in the Colombian judiciary. Uh, so this question I'm going to ask uh, is at the very heart of my research agenda and I needed to ask it, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, because a few years ago, Professor Jaramillo, um, you were nominated by the president to be a justice of the Colombian Constitutional Court, uh, but you were not selected by the Congress afterwards. Um, so I'm, I've always been curious to know what were the main, the main uh, barriers you found uh, in that process, particularly considering that you were a, a woman, but you have also promoted uh, a, a very progressive feminist agenda. So how, how was it like getting a very patriarchal? <laughs> political system as the one we have in Colombia? So it was difficult. So in Colombia, the president and the two other high courts send uh, candidates to the Senate for an election. So it is an election. It's not a confirmation hearing, but rather an election. So uh, when I was uh, you know, appointed in that set of three, uh, there were two vacancies in the court, four, I'm thinking, no, four vacancies. I think, no, I don't remember now, but I was, I was lucky enough to be in a set of three women. And so that supposedly gave us an advantage. It will be a woman anyway, right? So there wouldn't be a competition with the men. So that was interesting uh, situation. The second one was that the it was a set that was arranged for one woman to win, and she was quite deserving, right? Uh, she had been at the Constitutional Court as a clerk, as a magistrado auxiliar for many years, and then she had been this juridical 
uh, secretary for the president. So she had been doing what she needed to do to become a justice. It was fair that she was a justice. The only reason why I decided to participate was that she's very deserving, but she's always also Opus Dei. So I thought, well, if there's going to be women in the constitutional court, it shouldn't be, you know, from, from like an extreme version of the Catholicism that is still, you know, that's mainstream in the country. So I was very committed to winning this election, even though I knew all the odds were against me. Uh, because she not only had, you know, the career, she had done what she needed to do to get into that position, um, but also she had, you know, the support from pres the president himself who sent her a, a lobbying team. Then it turned out that there was another woman that was very similar to me. We were both from Universidad de Los Andes. We had both been teaching. We had both, you know, agendas in human rights who also had the favor of the president. So I ended up being the only one who was doing the whole campaign on my own. The two of them had lobbying teams uh, sent you know, from the establishment and I was doing my campaign on my own. So I used what I had, which was the media and social networks. And uh, I've, I've worked a lot with, um, uh, with the media. I've, forever, writing opinion pieces, I give them interviews, I send them information. So uh, I've always thought that they are, they are doing a difficult job. I have in my family people who've been very influential in the media, so that also, of course, helps, right? They would send me the contacts, etc. So I use the media, and I think I won the campaign in the media, but I lost in Congress. <laughs> And, uh, but this was interesting, Maya. No one ever mentioned to me directly, you're a feminist and we don't like what you say. There was never, not even the most, they told what they didn't like and they mounted a full campaign on that was that I was an atheist. I told them at some point in some meeting, I said, you know, I'm a post-religious person. I'm not an atheist, I'm not an agnostic. I just don't think we should speak, we should talk about religion in this context. I respect religion very much, but we're a secular country. And so I was branded an atheist and I, the counter campaign was that I was an atheist and, and I shouldn't be, I guess that, that why it works so well was atheist in Colombia is a way of calling you a communist. And so I guess that that was the, the stigma that they created. This was how they mobilized against me. But, but of course, everyone was very civil. And this was an election where a UN women provided money for the, for the election of these four justices to be transparent. And so that, you know, it was very clear to the public, uh, all the discussions, et cetera. So everyone was very civil uh, and very nice. Uh, it was a lot of work, right? I not only had to work with the media, but I had to do a lobby campaign on my own. So I had to go speak to each and every one of the 100 senators. I was grateful that some people was kind enough to give me their phone numbers, et cetera. So I finally was able to meet with everyone and they met with me, which was a lot to obtain in these contexts. And, um, and uh, you know, it was interesting for me. Uh, it was a lot of work. And I would have to say, I just, today, I just published an opinion piece in which I tell two anecdotes, which were maybe some of the most disgusting ones, uh, which was one in which a uh, previous senator and president, Alvaro Uribe Vélez, asked me, well, and what does your father do? And I thought, what? You know, what should I say? My poor father, he has nothing to do with this. And I just said, well, he's a professor, <laughs> which in part is true. Um, by Michael. And then the other one was that I had to see something that I have been told of, but I, which was how there were the Senate members were sold sexual services in exchange for their vote. They were given, they were, you know, there were these women who, had particular attires and they would walk 
like nearby and, and they would show pictures and you know you can have these services it was kind of strange it was very secretive and the senators would go to them i thought it was you know interesting that these women were in this position and sometimes we would talk you know so they never told me what they were doing of course but i i thought you know, it was hard for me, but I thought, why would they have to be in this situation? They have to feel very badly about doing this in this context. But anyway, um, so it's very difficult, of course. It's a campaign with 100 uh, voters uh, uh, whose interests and inclinations you don't know, you know nothing about. And uh, it's very difficult to have any type of negotiation. So, so yes, it's hard. And uh, there's other, so my, I, the opinion piece that I published today is about the election of uh, four justices for the Supreme Court, which is another court. Uh, and the Supreme Court at this moment only has two women out of 23 justices. So there's a whole issue of how will they choose to have more women and it's been, it, it's been difficult. Uh, and this election is by the justices themselves. So the sitting justices will select from a list that they were sent by the by another judicial body. It's a very complicated <laughs> system. But the thing is that through these systems, we're having less and less women in these other courts. Now we have many women in the Constitutional Court, which is good, I think. OK. Uh Super interesting, also a bit shocking. Uh, the, the this thing about the interest in your religious position is it's quite shocking. Shocking in the Colombian context, because I, I would have thought that they would have been interested, for example, in your positions on abortion, for example, uh, instead of of um, tagging you or, or or naming you as an atheist. Uh, so so that gives me lots of things to, to, to think about and, and, and takes us back to the importance of paying attention to other social categories when analyzing women's access to, to certain positions. Um, I, I'm afraid this conversation between our second souls <laughs> is, is coming to an end. Uh, so I'm going to ask you uh, one last question, more, more general um before before we move on to the questions from the audience um so i'm i'm interested to know what you think are the particular challenges for women in in law and in society in general in latin america it's, it's i know it's a very general broad question but yes what what would be the challenges of of giving voice uh to women in latin america Hmm. That's an interesting, I think the first challenge is that we don't know very well where women are in the legal profession. So we're just at this, in Latin America. So some of us know what happens in Argentina and others know what happened in Chile, but we don't have a full picture. It's, uh, we're trying to build one. This is our task now in, in Redalas, but we don't have one yet. Um, but I would say that in the league, that one thing that's very interesting, in, and I guess this has happened in many countries in the world, is that it's been more than 30 years since about half of the legal profession is, uh, is women, right? Women are half of the lawyers in, in the world. And women still, and women lawyers um, uh, do go into the profession and, and part of this probably is because law is still an undergraduate degree, so that people have uh, the energy and the resources to do uh, to get this degree. And uh, this might explain the number of women lawyers. But Maya, you also know a lot about this. You're the expert. But anyway, the number of women lawyers um, might explain the amount of women in the bureaucracy and in the judicial branch in the more administrative positions. So we have lots of women in the financial sector. We have lots of women in bureaucracies. We have women in the judicial branch in the lower parts of the economy. So um, 
but that's where we are. But I, I guess, you know, my two big questions uh, are with regards to women in the legal profession are on the one hand, how, how and for Latin America in general, how many of the women lawyers are going out of the profession because of marriage or motherhood? Uh, for the Colombian case, we know that for elite women, uh, this happens quite frequently, right? So the women in the elites leave their professions uh, when they marry, not even when they have children. So it's not only or mainly about care, it's also, and probably more importantly for elite women, is about um, status. So I, I, so we know that for elite women in Colombia in general, I would like to know how much that happens for women lawyers and uh, how much it happens uh, in other places in Latin America. Uh, so I, um, when I go over the list of the best students that have graduated in Los Andes, most of them are women. But for what I know, most of them are not in the profession. So, so that I think is a challenge. How do we retain the talent within the profession, right? I've had many students who are, you know, I, I, it's not reject, rejects, it's like they've been expelled from, so the bright, very bright students that go to work the bureaucracy, right? In the planning department, for example, I have one student that went to work in the planning department. She wrote the whole plan for victims in Colombia, which was really challenging. And, and she, I, she's never told me exactly why, but she was so burnt out that after a year, she came to academia and said, give me any job. This is what I want to do. I just can't be there, right? So so how, how often does this story happen? That's part of, I have some research on women in law firms in Colombia also, and, and they are also, by the time that some of them, as young as, you know, three years after entering the law firm and after billing the most, they just get tired, burnt out, and they go out of the law firm. So this, this dropping out, you know, having opportunities open and then dropping out is something that I think it's a huge challenge that we need to understand more and, and culturally work on. Um, I think, yes, we need to uh, have more women in uh, positions of leadership in the legal profession, for sure. We've had women deans of law schools and even of prominent law schools, uh, such as Los Andes, but, um, but it's kind of sporadic and anecdotal. And it's like they appoint them in moments in which there's a lot of work to be done and very little money. So it's a moment of crisis. And so the women have to, you know, handle the crisis, make these places productive, make the rough decisions, fire the people. So you know, that's not really leadership. That's like doing someone else's dirty laundry. Um, and, and so we need more women in these positions of leadership, both in academia and in other, and in the judiciary where, you know, it still is a mystery why these election rules are not, um, are not working uh, for women. And we need women in law firms. I, I, I do have to say that I do see lots of changes in the last 10 years and things are just getting much, much better. Uh, but, but I would say that both that understanding why we're losing the good ones and then uh, understanding why we're not being able to break that glass, even though we've been there for the longest, right? In the law, in law we've been there for uh, you know, may, many, many years. Uh, so, so those I think are, are big questions for us now. Now, I would have to say one of my, it's uh, I've, oh, very, very challenging, uh, the diversity of women in legal academia. Uh, I think it's it, in legal academia and law firms might be the hardest, right? In the bureaucracy and the judicial branch, there's quite uh, diversity amongst women. In academia, not, not a lot, very, white, the mestizo, almost white. Uh, and, it, and that's true for most countries in Latin America. And so uh, we need to find ways for the projects of African 
uh, Afro Latin American and indigenous and trans women uh, uh, to have a place in academia, in legal academia. So that's that's a big challenge for sure. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for this uh, really thought-provoking conversation. I've, I've gotten amazing material for my thesis, by the way. Uh, so, so thank you. But now I'm going to hand it back to to Professor Van Prak, so we can open the floor uh, to to other questions, I guess. But thank you again. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias to both of you uh, for a very inspiring and detailed and, and both micro and macro dialogue uh, that incorporated uh, stories and, and ambitions and agendas. Um, so I'm going to open it up and see um, if you could use the little uh, hand option, then I can see that on my list of participants. And <clears throat> and um, I, I'm sure that Professor uh, Yaranijo would be happy to uh, answer questions. Maybe even Maya would be happy to answer questions instead of only asking the questions. No, no. <laughs> um, I mean, perhaps I, I, I would just jump in to ask about this challenge. I, um, you, you talked about being left alone by your, your, your university, which allowed you to do more. I mean, the, 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 not just the quantity, but the scope, the range, the ambition of the projects that you've taken on, that you've been a leader in. Um, I think that that's right, that you need, you need enough space, right? Space and time, and you need a supportive context um, and and uh, so in the academic context, so we talk about universities and and making sure that you're not submerged in uh, stuff that doesn't allow you to do more. But I wonder if that also there's also a risk, and maybe this hasn't yet materialized or isn't materializing in Latin America yet. Maybe the energy is still there across borders to come together to use that space to do more. But of course, there's also the risk of being left alone and then just being isolated and having colleagues in academia who then um, don't necessarily have the kind of the support and the impetus and the encouragement to reach out to others, to create those networks, to create reading groups beyond classrooms, uh, et cetera. So I, I as a, a professor, would be just interested in hearing any any reflections on, on those challenges? Hmm. Well, it's it. So I have to say that we started with, well, it was, it was a very small group of professors who were full time and you know dedicated. And so when we started, although I was hired through a competition, you know, there were several different uh candidates that were evaluated, uh, uh, you know, most people were just friends of the dean that was at that moment in charge, right? So, you know, I think they were elite. I think they were good. These were the professors I had. But uh, so that meant that, that there wasn't a lot of competition over resources. There, were, there wasn't a lot of prestige involved. No one knew how prestige was built in academia. So there wasn't an intense competition over prestige um, or over resources. So I think that that meant that we could choose the projects that we really had our heart on, right? Because remember that we were very committed to making this work. So we were obsessive about doing lots of things. Uh, but we, we were able to choose the projects not because of the number of points that they would give us for the following review, right? There were not, when I started teaching, there were no reviews for professors. You know, there was just the dean would call you to his office. Great, you published that book. Very good. Uh, and, and so we had this freedom. So that's good. <laughs> but then there, I, then I think you're right in saying, well, there's a reason why there's the points and the reviews and the, no, there's a, uh, the, the impact that your scholarship has 
you know, should not only be measured by the dean, you know, giving you uh, a heads up, it should, should be other metrics. Uh, so we worked hard to create those metrics and to, you know, give people incentives. But I think the freedom to initially just get my ideas out and, you know, work with groups of people who are interested in things. So Maya is mentioning, and many times I feel I just publish on almost every topic, but this is because I publish in so many collaborations. Uh, but I think I, I would have, uh, I would have been timid uh, about engaging in these collaborations if I had all the time in my mind, will that give you the points you need for your review? Would that give you the points, et cetera? So, uh, so I, that, there's where I find, of course, then when I would say to the Dean, listen, I need, you know, I need to go to this conference in the US or in Canada, or you know, my dream was going to Africa or India for, for a conference. But you know, even nearby, I just need to go to the US. And, and he would say, well, we actually don't have any money. Go find it on your own, which was, terribly offensive even because other professors did get money for their conferences in other places. And not only because they were men, but because they were doing like the mainstream professional, I'm going to a civil procedure conference in Argentina. It's the global civil procedure something or other and, and that they would get funding. So for me, it was go find some NGO that will fund, fund you. Um, and that happened, you know, so Redalas was one of the ways in which I got support for these, uh, you know, being able to have conversations across the continent. And, uh, and so, you know, as, as difficult as it was that the project was not valued within the community where I was, uh, the, the transcontinental support that I had was, and I have to say that also uh, my professors at Harvard uh, and the, in the few years after my PhD were also very supportive of the projects. And so we were invited frequently and we were part of collections that they were coordinating. And so that helped in, so that this being left alone or let alone um, would not end up in isolation, ostracization, et cetera. I did, however, I've, I've also tried to be the dean of the law school several times. And in those processes, I've been told that the fact that I work on feminism is not well regarded by the university directives. And that that's an obstacle for me ever being appointed to that position. Um, when they have to, so when I was appointed full professor, the president of the university asked me, how should I introduce you? And I said, well, I have all these contributions in feminism. And he said, no, I don't want to mention feminism. Tell me something else. And I said, well, I've worked for many years and I've done many things at the university. So I've been director of this, director of that, director of that. He said, okay, I'll mention that. So, so yeah, it has its costs. Yeah, for sure. It, it's not being free of, of, of costs in engaging in this agenda. Um, but what I, what I was, I, what I was thinking, Shauna, I see now my, so some of the young colleagues uh, going through review processes in Colombia, which are not transparent, which are, um, you know, even persecutorial. And, and I think, well, at least I didn't have to go through that, right? If, you know, I, um, they didn't like what I did, but they, you know, they as long as I published and I had a Harvard law degree, and you know that was enough to not pay too much attention to what I was doing. And I, there's, yeah. so, there's so much in there, Isabel, uh, but uh, I think I would particularly underscore the significance of transparency and and also the opportunities of collaboration and how collaborations can take you on paths that you wouldn't have necessarily anticipated. And then you become, you just have more circles of conversation in which to engage. And I think that really came across uh, in your response. So I know we had uh, Vishaka, another one of our doctoral students had, uh, had a question, Vishaka. 
Yes, I think you kind of um, referred to this in part in your previous answer, but um, I would like to thank you for all the uh, you know wonderful um, stories and inspiring things you've been saying. But and I really appreciate the fact that you have done so much mentoring um, in your career. But um, there is also an issue where um, people who belong to minorities and women um, academics have been uh, given more responsibility to d carry out mentoring um, of people who are uh, of minority communities, uh, of students who belong to their communities. And um, some cases that gives them an added burden and not enough time to work on, you know, things like publications um, that people who don't have so much mentoring do have time for. And um, the problem is that mentoring might not count for much in, in those review processes that you spoke of. So, um, so like I know some professors, they're like, I'm not your mother. I'm also just a supervisor. Or I'm just a professor because, you know, they don't want students to expect so much mentoring just because you're a female professor or, you know, that, that expectation that students have because of your gender. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I just wonder how the structure can be changed so that this mentoring can be retained without it becoming a burden on academics. I know. I hear this from uh, from many of my colleagues, how uh, mentoring it becomes a burden and service within the university becomes also a burden. I have to mention that I've also worked a lot supporting student mobilization against sexual harassment in Los Andes. And, and I've worked with university authorities in a gender program and I've been trying for the last 10 years to convince them that it cannot be my volunteering time, that it has to be you know, a program. Uh, but we're not there yet. So, so, uh, but I have, so I hear that. And, and this is why I say when one has the pressure of producing certain very specific things and, and making, and producing that takes so much time, uh, the opportunities to do these other things are just closed off. So I, I understand that. But I have to say, I'm not, I mean, maybe it's because I'm from another generation and the prestige was not what we were invested in, right? So what we were invested in was creating a community. So mentoring, it, you cannot have a community if you're not open to this, you know, to these people who want to grow and learn. Now, Maybe it's also because of my personality that I'm a very strict professor. So I don't get a lot of the, you know, so I don't get a lot of the comments that would lead me to tell them, I'm not your mother, I'm your supervisor. It's kind of, they feel actually, sometimes I have to ask, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Because I've had students, you know, tell me that they cried and cried because it was so difficult the work that I was asking them to do. And so and so I thought, why didn't you tell me before? It's not, right? I just thought, you know, that you were so good. You had to be engaged in a very, you know, you had to be uh, aspiring to the best. So, um, so, I've, so now I, I ask in particular my doctoral students, you know, how are you doing? And, you know, not the last, but, but I, 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 at least in my case, the academic mentorship has been much, much more than the, the emotional accompaniment, which I'm not so good at. And I, I always feel that someone else should be better at doing it. Uh, and, 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 and for that academic accompaniment, I just feel it's, you know, it's such a gift, right? It's part of my, how would I, you know, prepare for the courses I want to teach? How do I, you know, think through the problems that I'm interested in? If it's not, because there's all these students who are very eager 
to have this moment. Um, and so I've also, so in the university where I teach, we have very lead students from Colombia, uh, very good students overall, but many of these students come with so much energy. Right? They want to do this project. So sometimes I've just invited them, let's write an amicus for the court for this case in the pandemia, right? So it's like a really important case. No one wants to write an amicus because no one has time. Everyone's struggling with depression and so much care work that they're, so I don't have a lot of care work. My children are already teenagers. They're, you know, they're good. They don't need me all the time uh so let's write this amicus and i had 40 students sit down on a saturday night to think you know how can i help i want to write this amicus just let me and these are these are pieces that i would just send to the court i don't i don't feel that you know that they need corrections are such good students they're they're just so motivated and they're so good so so I understand what you're talking about this this work, which is strenuous, and uh, and I think we have to to transform our academic culture so that it doesn't fall on minorities, it doesn't fall on women uh, to do this work, so that we are all engaged in the the emotional support for those who are not as brilliant and good. Um, and uh, and I've tried to to do my part in in changing that, but it's it's not it's it hasn't been easy. I think uh, uh, we we the the business of legal education is transformed, and we need to learn many many skills that we didn't have before. And yeah, no, I mean, so you're right in your comment. I just want to say that maybe it's the mentoring I'm speaking about is not that. The, that other brave professors do. I, I I do more of the exciting part of the mentoring. Okay, well, I am I, I'm sure that those of us who are are still here are kind of sad that the time has gone by so quickly. But that actually brings us to the end uh, end of this first workshop and and a very dynamic and and inspiring dialogue. So. Uh, Gracias de nueve, Maya. Uh, gracias de nueve, Isabel. And, and thank you so much um, for sharing. And, uh, and I hope people enjoyed that format of the back and forth. Uh, I, think, um, I think it was really delightful to, to listen to how much, how, how rich the conversation was and how, how I'm sure many of us could find connections to either our own experience, our own plans, dreams, uh, connections, uh, etc. And I appreciated very much, um, uh, you know, in an academic setting, the way in which Professor Yaramijo, that you you kind of translated academic, academic conversations into practice, advocacy, action, activism. And I think that that's, uh, that's really important that not to kind of separate these, that what we do in, in um, as teachers and learners and scholars is indeed not just connected to, but can actually be defined as action and activism and, and practice. Um, and I think uh, we all very much appreciated the way in which you talked about not just the value, but I, I think also the honor of leading and, and teaching and supervising and demanding hard work and I think uh, that also uh, you explicitly mentioned that in this last answer, but I think it's uh, without that hard work, all of the projects that you've talked about in Colombia, across the boundaries of countries in Latin America and beyond uh, is not possible. Uh, the Associate Dean Research uh, left a little uh, earlier and asked me specifically to thank you on his behalf, uh, Daniel Weinstock. Um, and I wanted to, just to let you know, yes, Elise has put in the chat uh, the information about our next workshop, a little bit of a different time, partly because of the time difference with our guest who will be speaking to us from Sri Lanka. Uh, and then we'll be in dialogue with Vishaka, whom you just heard from. Uh, and also Luisa, another uh, doctoral student. So uh, Wednesday, November 24th um, at 10 a.m. So uh, thank you again uh, to all of you and for um, just this lovely learning hour and a half together. Thank you very much, Shona. And thank you, Maya. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.